Okay, hello everyone and welcome to our talk um, on FOSDEM 2021, which is like first, first talk in the air, um, hopefully not the last one. Uh, we are very excited to bring you um, some quite unique experience, some quite unique content of going through the Google monitoring system, uh, which is called Monarch, and comparing it with uh, what we have in open source really. But before that, let's have a short introduction. I'm here with Ben. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Ben. Uh, I was an intern at Red Hat Observability Team. Uh, I'm one of the tunnels maintainers and also contributors to many open source projects. Uh, I like reading books, listening to podcasts, and playing soccer in my spare time. Thanks, Ben. Uh, my name is Bartek and I'm principal software engineer at Red Hat. I will work for observability team and I'm co-author of the Thanos project and maintainer of Prometheus. And uh, I literally love community and working together in open source building, you know, distributed systems, especially in Go. And I'm also active in the CNCF's uh, Seek Observability where I'm tech lead there. So um, you're welcome to join us. Okay, let's start. I think in the beginning of the year, it's, uh, it's always good to step back a little bit and take a fresh look on, on things. For example, how monitoring is going to shape in 2021. Is there a still demand for monitoring, for example? In 2020, industry was slowly replacing humans uh, with Kubernetes operator, <laughs> obviously, but still someone has to uh, monitor those operators. And, things they are operating. So at the end, observability and monitoring are not going anywhere. I think what we are saying is actually opposite, right? The demand um, is constantly growing to do increased complexity of systems, uh, including serverless applications, mentioning uh, mentioned operators and more automation overall. So we know monitoring is crucial. What about metric itself? Are metrics still related and kind of needed and required? Um, you know, other signals exist there as well, and they are irre uh, irreplaceable. In fact, in 2020 alone, popularity of event-based signals like logging and tracing uh, has grown a, a lot. It's also much more accessible than before with emerging lightweight cloud systems like Loki or Tempo or many, many others. Um, additional interest in systems like or like a project like open telemetry and and overall signal correlations went high as well after all of those and more um kind of there are many voices kind of questioning do we still need metrics we could calculate metrics from events right and as a team kind of member responsible for kind of red hat monitoring and openshift we are periodically asking the same question right uh, as it would be, you know, some complexity improvement if you could just drop one signal. But still, many sources, our own experience and customers that we have confirm the importance of the metrics. And the reason is simple. Metric systems are generally magnitude cheaper, if not more, simpler to use and operate for monitoring purposes. This is because metric, uh, metrics cannot be the, you know, um, cannot by design store all the context of everything um, due to cardinality reasons. So users naturally um, have to focus on collecting aggregated information, focus on what matters, for example, service level um, indicators. This limits the data you, are, you need to collect and ingest and uh, it's kind of uh, compressible with time as well. Of course, it would be amazing. We could just, you know, um, collect every event around us, um, around my system operations and persist all the context around it using just logs and tracing. But as January 21, if you want to have a solid monitoring without overspending tons of money on infrastructure and engineering time, metric is your first option. With this in mind, let's just, uh, Let's just have a very fun experiment today. Um, we agreed that we need kind of a metric system, a monitoring system, ID, scalable and cheap. And there is a common pattern in our industry in open source to build on the shoulders of giants, to not reinvent the wheel, right? For example, let's take Google systems. They overall have to build systems that are planet scale, super fast and super reliable. There was a, there was a kind of reason why Borgmon older Google monitoring system 
was an inspiration for open source Prometheus system, a default monitoring you know, metric system uh, in the CNCF. In the same way Kubernetes is based on Borg, a Google uh, orchestration uh, system, Zookeeper is modeled after Google's Chubby system, uh, log service, similar with protobuf, uh, so protocol buffers and gRPC. There is some similar technology existing in Google as well. That was kind of inspiration for that. So is there anything else we can learn from Google on monitoring drought? That's the question. Yes, recently in summer 2020, Google published amazing paper about Monarch, a newer version of uh, Google Planet Scale monitoring system that was meant to support or replace uh, Borgon in some case, Borgmon in some cases, so the previous monitoring system. So question is, is there anything similar in open source? And we would like to put one thesis out. We believe that in, in many ways, you can treat Thanos system as the open source monarch. Similarly as we treat Prometheus being modeled after Borgman. The funny thing is that we had no idea about monarch when we were designing Thanos, yet some of our ideas and decisions ended up being exactly the same or similar to Google's one. I think it, this confirms that there are, you know, um, after all, not that many possible ways of solving um, scalability problems, especially with metrics. And uh, before we start, disclaimer, um, we, we are really admiring the engineering on Google side and, and overall engineering experience, but we have never worked at Google. So everything we tell you here is based on the official data published by Google, uh, especially for, from um, research papers and, um, and Google, uh, for example, as a rebook. So can we find the monarch in the open source world? Uh, actually, as Thanos developers, after reading the monarch paper, we find out that the Thanos architecture and design is very similar to monarch. Next, uh, I will go through some parts of the paper and by comparing the two systems, uh, I will show you the similarities and the differences between them. And behind this experiment, uh, we have one goal in our mind, which is to expand our horizons and learn what can we do better to improve the Thanos project. So let's first start from the use cases. Monarch as a monitoring system the use cases are very common. Uh, the first one is for alerting. The second one is for displaying dashboards for services status. And the last one is for doing some ad hoc queries for uh, debugging problems and uh, exploration. So what about Thanos? And Thanos as an open source and the highly available Prometheus setup, they definitely have the same like common use cases. So what we can say is that they are both systems that allowing to monitor, debug, and alert on workload state. So in the paper, we can find four main reasons why Monarch was created in the first place. Because as we know, a Borgmon, a previous uh, monitoring system at Google, was already existing at that time. Overall, um, the main kind of the main uh, kind of motivations we listed here are kind of two limitations of Borgmon uh, that are standing out. First of all, the fact that Borgmon was centralized, or actually is centralized, sorry, decentralized, um, similar to Prometheus actually. Um, this means that all your critical monitoring um, is within single binary that is running uh, in your cluster together with your applications. And uh, this has a powerful um, advantage of having everything simple and uh, reliable because everything is kind of together computed in the same cluster. However, um, the problem is with the user experience. You need to operate uh, that binary on yourself. You need to scale it on yourself. You need to deal with problems on, on like, um, alone as a, as a team, right? Um, so it might sound simple, but like in practice, it just takes time. It consumes your resources that you could kind of, you know, use on developing your own application. So at the time, the centralization came as a major problem. And uh, 
Additionally to that, it was extremely hard for people to aggregate the data on the global level. So when you have multiple clusters and multiple work modes, then how do you kind of get this data on uh, a multi-cluster level as well and alert on that level? Secondly, um, it was hard to scale ingestion capabilities of Borgman. You need to kind of create two, and then how do you, again, have this aggregated view across those shards, how to manually, you know, scale up and down. I mean, everything has to be manually. That was not perfect and ideal situation. And funny enough, motivation for creating Thanos were exactly similar to those for Monarch, except instead of Borgmon, we had a Prometheus that was a little bit um, limited in, in some various scalability cases. So the same as Borgmon, uh, you know, Borgmon versus Monarch, Thanos enables global view and optional centralized storage um, backed by object storage that was hard to achieve with Prometheus alone. With Thanos, it's also much easier to work on automatic ingestion and scraping sharding mechanisms, and even allow basic use cases like, you know, multi-replica Prometheus for, for example, a high availability, um, for higher availability of ingestion. Thanos solves this problem, and that was the motivation behind that. Uh, so next, let's go through some high-level architectures between the two systems. So first, let's take a look at uh, Monarch. And this is the Monarch architecture, and you can find out there that it has multi-layer architecture where there are global and uh, zone components here. So the components color with red, and they are responsible for uh, data ingestion, and the component colored with green, and they are responsible for like data query. And we will skip the blue components here because they are mainly for configurations. So for the right path, and uh, the ingested data will be routed by the some global ingestion routers, and they will be routed to like, leaf routers in each zone. And finally, going to the leaf nodes for storage, and uh, for the read pass. So there are one. Uh, there are some like root mixers which query data in a fun out way. So the queries will be routed to some zone mixers and finally going to leave nodes to fetch uh, some data. So there are also like one uh, index servers component, which gathers some indexes, uh, indexes information. And this is very useful for guiding distributed query execution to improve the performance. So what about Thanos architecture? So you can see here, the architecture of Thanos is very, very similar to Monarch. It also have a multi-layer architecture by having a global query and multiple zone queries. And for the right pass, it has, a, it has one global like routing receiver for routing uh, data requests. And the, the actual data is ingested at the wrong, uh, zone receiver level. And for the query pass, the global query will do some find out query and uh, it will hit uh, the receivers in the end. So for the data storage, the most recent data will be stored in memory at uh, the receiver component and uh, the long-term data will be uploaded to the object storage. So Thanos provides a stock gateway component for their purposes. So that's the design. And uh, next, let's talk about the data model. So there are some differences here. So in Monarch, the, uh, it stores some like time series data in schematized table, which means that you need to define uh, the table columns before you ingest uh, the data. So in this diagram, you can find out that uh, it has multiple key columns and only one value column. So for the key columns, it can have two sources. And one is called target schema, and it's related to the monitor entity. So you can see here, it contains uh, a job column and a, a class column. So it's related to the entity itself, or maybe some locations. And uh, the, there's another schema called metric schema, which is used for uh, describing the metric itself. So in this example, it's uh, RPC service latency. So it has two key 
columns for the service name and the command. So which uh, is useful for describing this like latency value. So like let's talk about tunnels. So tunnels uses exactly the same data model as Prometheus. So it's schemaless. So you can find out here that it contains one metric name and several uh, labels. Also one value type, which is a float number. But actually in tunnels, we have uh, one concept called external labels, which is very, very similar to the target schema in Mona. And it's useful for like grouping the, all the target data together. And uh, here in this example, uh, it's zone, which represents a location. So at the end, our conclusion for demo is that uh, although they have some similarities, and uh, they are different in the design. So for next, let's talk about examples. So exa uh, Monarch has some built-in support for distribution, which is a histogram in Prometheus. And uh, one distribution can have multiple uh, buckets and each bucket can have one, uh, one exemplar. So in this heat map diagram, there are multiple like red points and they are exemplars. So when you want to debug some high latency uh, requests or outliers, yeah, you can just uh, uh, click the exemplars here and go to the trace, trace view for debugging. And uh, yeah, it's very useful. So what about uh, the tunnels ecosystem? So actually in uh, the open metric standards, it already have uh, examples support. And uh, in some Prometheus client libraries, uh, examples are also supported as well. But uh, for storing the data in Prometheus itself, there are some like working progress PRs right now. So it's not merged yet, but it's very close. And the Grafana, it already have some like very fancy uh, exemplar UIs here. So which is very promising. And uh, for tunnels, once these like uh, working progress PR in Prometheus are merged, we can uh, just query the examples from Prometheus and uh, the example data can be propagated via remote write protocol. So at that time, we can implement the examples APIs at the store API level in tunnels, and then the users can use uh, examples in tunnels. Okay, going with, uh, with the order of Monarch paper deep dive, um, we came to the metric collection. It's definitely, well, more complex than it sounds, but in principle, applications in Monarch um, have some libraries, ready libraries that are pushing metric samples in required frequency to the ingestion router, which is co-located in the same cluster. And then this ingestion router is respons responsible for discovery and making sure, uh, making the decision where um, to forward, to which uh, zone or destination cluster uh, forward given um, um, data. So this feels great, but in Thanos, we um, kind of leverage the existing Prometheus stack. And there is a reason for that. First of all, let's explain how it works. So in client, on client side, um, we can reuse existing instrumentation, Prometheus instrumentation, and, uh, and use essentially pool model, which is in our opinion, much, much better uh, model for general type of infrastructure. infrastructure. It's much easier to ask application to expose open metrics protocol and control discovery and scrape frequency and remote write complexity from the single agent purpose that we deliver instead of having this implemented uh, in each of the uh, client implementations. And while this is possible on Google side, it's impossible to reproduce the same in the community because um, the push mechanisms are just much more complex. Yeah, and we are talking here about red rise limits, buffers, and, um, and all potential languages and instrumentation libraries in the open source would need to re-implement that. And it's just hard to implement like in one place, what about the whole world? Because of com co uh, compatibility and simpli simplicity, we chosen to leverage Prometheus and open metrics for client metric collection. Funny enough, um, 
when you look on the both diagrams on the left uh, for Monarch and right on, on Thanos and Prometheus ecosystem, it kind of looks at the end the same. They have kind of, you know, the same amount of components. And uh, well, this is proving that whatever you choose, push and, push and pull, they are at the end scaling in the same way. Um, it's really about the small trade, trade or like smaller or bigger trade-offs that you are uh, balancing between. Um, it's worth to mention also that even with open metrics, there are possibilities to push metrics in very edge cases like serverless, that might be not edge case anymore because it's more and more popular, but also bad jobs and stuff like that. You can totally do that, but it has to be by design minority of your requests. Now, let's talk about the server side where things are even more tricky because you need to make sure the receive part is uh, reliable and scalable. So how Monarch is doing this. So first of all, Monarch is taking the, um, the, the, the right request from, uh, from the ingestion routers into leaf router, and it forwards that further down into target leaves responsible for uh, given target ranges. So everything is sharded by targets. This leaf is writing this data into memory and then uh, recovery um, persistent log. And, uh, this data in memory is then used for querying as well. In the same time, it is uh, performing a light compression, uh, which um, is interesting that it shares timestamps from the same targets and also performs delta encoding. This is really similar to what, uh, what Thanos is doing. And uh, we have receiver instead of kind of leaf. Um, and generally it um, essentially um, have the forwarding capabilities. So you, you have that in your receiving cluster, you have receiver that can forward to the proper receiver uh, based on the hash ring configuration. And uh, then the receiver can ingest this data and write to the local Prometheus DSDB. We reuse the same code as Prometheus, which means it is stored in memory and uh, have some uh, write ahead log as well. At the end, DSDB also encode this time series using Corilla encoding which is uh, a certain version of Delta encoding at the end. Monarch is mainly uh, designed for storing data in memory, and, but as the paper mentioned, it also like have some uh, durability support. So it uses some log files for uh, durability and a long-term uh, repository for storage. So let's take a look at uh, the tunnel system. So uh, in Thanos, uh, we have a Thanos receiver, and uh, the like the key difference here is that the uh, Thanos receiver will not keep all the data in memory forever. So it uh, once the data is written to the storage, it will return to the write ahead log first, and every two hours the data will be compacted to a block and uh, uploaded to a remote object storage. And uh, in practice, there's one more pattern, and we can apply this the same pattern to Prometheus uh, with a sidecar. So this is uh, extremely useful because if you don't want to set up the push model, yeah, you can just you add one sidecar to your Prometheus, and it works uh, perfectly well. Uh, next, let's talk about the query query language they use uh, in Monarch. Mm, they use their own query language. I will not introduce this in detail, but it's really like human readable. So it uses some like filter operators to select some columns. And it also does one join, a group by, and uh, finally aggregate on the latency. So yeah, you can find the like uh, results here. It contains one uh, key column for label and one label column for the latency. And uh, in the Thanos ecosystem, Thanos just use, reuses the same like from standard PromQL. So it's uh, simple, but also powerful. It also supports uh, aggregations and joins. And, but the most important thing is that uh, it has 100% PromQL compatibility. So it can use the awesome like monitoring mixings. And so users can have like out of box Grafana dashboards and alerting rules. So if you are interested in this, you can check out this website. And next, let's talk about the different query types. Monarch has two 
like you usually have two use cases for query. One is ad hoc queries. It's very easy to understand. It's just users using some like web UIs for like debugging or exploration. And another type of query is called sending queries. They are just periodically a periodic query whose results will be like written back to the Monarch system. And this is one uh, example diagram here. The evaluator sends out sending queries periodically. And finally, the results will be written back to the storage node, which is the leaf. And uh, in tunnels, actually, if you are familiar with the Prometheus ecosystem, you will find out that it's exactly the same thing as recording rules and alerts. So in tunnels, the tunnels ruler does the same job as the evaluator. It queries the querier and writes the results to its local TSDB. And but recently we are we have this proposal to improve the scalability of ruler, and we are redesigning the ruler to have a remote uh, remote receiver clusters as its storage, which means the results will be written back to the receiver clusters. And after we read out the Mona paper we find out that that's exactly the same design. Now, I hope you are ready for the last, but not the least feature that Monor has. This is something I'm incredibly excited about, as Thanos is literally unintentionally designed for this kind of, of amazing optimization. And Google actually describes uh, query execution to be scalable thanks to the primarily this feature, which is query pushdown capabilities. How it works? Well, let's look on the diagram on the right. We have such modern architecture. Uh, let's imagine naive query that sums some metrics over time and groups them together. In a naive approach, we would need to fetch all of the samples matching uh, from each of separate leaves nodes, then pass through the mixers and then process those on the root level. Lots of data pushed through the network, probably across different uh, you know, zones. This will cost a lot. Now, with query pushdown, we are pushing the query evaluation deeper into the stack, um, actually as close as possible to the underlying data, which is an amazingly, um, enormously kind of uh, beneficial um, to do. Instead of you know, samples on the leaf node, uh, we return kind of only evaluated results, so a sum of subset data, data, then the mixers has to merge that uh, into bigger partial result. And then at the root, you are merging like just a couple of some results and present that to the user. Obviously, um, you know, it reduces the network usage significantly, significantly, as well as allowing full or partial concurrency, which is super amazing. Uh, Worth to mention that obviously you cannot potentially um, use query pushdown for all kinds of aggregations, like for example, top K. However, for most of the typical queries, we can do this optimization. Now, the, why it's amazing? Because we can apply exactly the same logic on tunnel side where querier will push down computation to underlying leaves. It's much more complex than it looks on the implementation side because as I mentioned, it has to work with different kinds of aggregations. It has to be, um, uh, precise, correct, consistent, and it has to work across different replications, but it's something we actively work on, and uh, you can actually read through the proposal and help us doing this. Okay, um, we didn't cover all the, you know, um, kind of com differences, for example, multi-tenancy, downsampling versus monarch aggregation, uh, replication on both sides, but at the end, we learned a lot. Uh, and we learned that Monarch is indeed kind of, I hope you agree, a, yeah, like similar, um, there it has more similarities and differences between um, each of those systems. And we also learned what we can improve in future. We could create, you know, uh, we can improve Thanos Prometheus encoding, for example, by sharing the timestamp of the same target, which we learned. We could, um, you know, play a little bit with the schema less. Um, model. It's superior for the users. It's much more flexible. However, it is kind of, you know, a problem to make sure everything for works on the storage layer. That's why there would be kind of nice way, um, nice optimization if we would know what are the target labels, what are the metric labels. Maybe there is a good way to optimize that. Um, 
And last but not the least, query pushdown and intermediate indexes would be enormous gain for query latency and efficiency. And that's our goal for 2021. Thank you for listening to us and uh, please visit our website and also uh, interactive tutorials if you are interested. Thank you. Thank you.